Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte Let's turn to the Mueller report. You've made clear that Congress should get the Mueller report with no redactions. Tell me where you stand on the issue of what kinds of redactions, if any, you think are acceptable in the public version of the Mueller report. Well, look, if there are classified portions of the report, if there's a classified annex, for example, uh, that may need to be close hold, uh, depending on whether that reveals sources and methods. There may even be some parts of that, though, that can be declassified in the public interest. And in fact, if you look at the Mueller indictments, those two dealing with the Russians, that went into very granular detail. That would have been previously classified information about what the budget was for that social media farm, about private emails between members of that social media farm and their family. Uh, all of that information at one point was classified, but the decision must have been made. The public interest outweighs that. Uh, and I think a similar analysis should be undertaken here. You've been clear and you're but you've been criticized a great deal for saying that you still see, quote, evidence of collusion, even though, according to Attorney General Barr, the Mueller report says, quote, the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities, unquote. So are you saying that Mueller got it wrong? No, and what I've said uh, on your show uh, and others, Jake, uh, for over a year now is that Yes, there's ample evidence of collusion in plain sight, but that is not the same thing as proof of a criminal conspiracy beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and that I would defer to Bob Mueller's judgment, and I do. But I think what we're talking about here is the difference between conduct that rises to the level of criminality uh, and conduct that is deeply unethical, unpatriotic, and corrupt that may not be criminal. And I think you saw from Mr. Mulvaney on your show last week, and indeed we see from Mr. Nunes and Mr. McCarthy, an attitude that ethics don't matter. Uh, if there's no crime, there's no foul. Uh, and I think if we get to that point in this country, uh, then we are in a very desperate situation. Well, let's talk about this, because you say you think what the Trump campaign members did was immoral, unethical, and corrupt, even if it was not enough for criminal charges. Mulvaney, the acting White House chief of staff, did tell me on the show last week that uh, ethical judgments are ultimately not your job. Take a listen. That's not the job of the House Intelligence Committee. It's not the job of the House Judiciary Committee. It's not the job of the House Oversight Committee. And importantly, members of Congress, even if they are the uh, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, don't get to substitute their judgment for the voters. What's your response, sir? Well, that is certainly the president's attitude. It's not the job of Congress to do oversight, period. Uh, and indeed, under the GOP Congress, they did no oversight. But it's our responsibility to root out fraud, corruption, waste, abuse, whether it rises to the level of criminality or not. Uh, if Mr. Mulvaney's standard is Congress cannot look into anything unless there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt of crime, then Congress would be able to do little or no oversight. That's simply not how Congress should act or ever has acted. Uh, we need to do our le legitimate oversight. We need to ferret out uh, any kind of uh, malfeasance or abuse. Uh, whether that rises to something that the Justice Department can prosecute or not. How do you respond to the suggestion made by every Republican on your committee, uh, they've called for you to step down, uh, that you going out there before this report came out and saying that there's evidence of collusion, and then Mueller comes out and says, we don't find any evidence uh, of conspiracy uh, or even uh, coordination, that that what you're saying and what you said is, is irresponsible because you're kind of muddying the waters. There is a standard that Mueller has, 
And then you have a different standard, and maybe people got confused, and maybe Democrats got their hopes up. Uh, look, I think there is a, a different standard here between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Republicans seem to think that as long as you can't prove it's a crime, then all is fair in love and war, uh, that it's all okay what the Trump administration, the Trump campaign does. I don't feel that way. I don't think most Americans feel that way. Uh, and Jake, what I've been saying all along is that the evidence that I'm concerned about is in plain sight. And I've used those words probably a hundred times. Uh, if the fact that the president called on the Russians to hack Hillary's emails, if the fact that Don Jr. said he loved to get the Russians help, all of this is in plain sight. If the Republicans think that's perfectly fine because it doesn't amount to the crime of conspiracy, then we are going to part company. And I'm not going to stop making the point that we should hold our president, our campaigns, our elected officials to a higher standard than mere criminality. And you have no regrets of anything you've said in the last couple of years? Uh, I don't regret calling out this president for what I consider deeply unethical and improper conduct. Not a bit. And I think the moment that we start to think that uh, that we should back away uh, from exposing uh, this kind of malfeasance and corruption is a dangerous point. Now, Jake, you've asked the question many times, uh, is there a risk of, of doing too much oversight? There is a risk when you have an immoral president, a president lacking in basic character who violates the norms of office, there is an even greater risk of doing too little oversight. So I make no apologies for that, and I'm going to continue holding this uh, administration accountable. It is Monday, the 8th of April of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. That's right, folks. We take really all of what's left from the weekend, chop it, dice it, mix it up into a really tasty, spicy dish for a Monday. Oh, my. What a weekend. Uh, it seems like Donald Trump has gone even more off the rails, if that is possible. Kirsten Nielsen, Zeke Heil, is not Nazi enough for the Nazis in the Nazi White House. You can imagine the kind of Nazis we're going to get when the Nazis take over the real Nazi White House. Oh my God. Stephen Miller, you know he's rubbing his hands together. And he's uh, saying, Jared, you're next. You know he is. He is a uh, palace intriguer. And uh, I uh, actually have a fantasy, uh, because I am a fiction writer of sorts, in which uh, Stephen Miller uh, is incarcerated and uh, vile things occur to him. Not, not the usual cliched things, but, you know, being whipped uh, with snakes by a troop of crazy clowns. Yeah, that's a right-wing meme that's going to be making the rounds. At least the clown part. The whipping of snakes by crazy clowns, uh, that's wholly uh, from the mind of, uh, well, an altered state. Hey, speaking of altered states, I had a weekend. And if you uh, visit with me on social media, you, you know about it. And that is my granddaughter and daughter-in-law. We're on the Oregon coast with their new dog, Dre Mack. And uh, it looks like Dre's got some pit in him and something else. I got to find out from Talia what that is. But he's a pretty big, strong dog. And uh, first day at the beach. And, uh, well, we call it the coast here. If there's some sand on the beach, then, then it's like a beach. But usually it's rocks and big old logs. So uh, they went to... Uh, Lincoln City, Depot Bay, that area of the Oregon coast. And at Depot Bay, there's a road in which uh, it's really spectacular. Sometimes the waves crash and, it, you know, water comes up on the road. Oh, wow, look at that. So the tide went out and they uh, scrambled down onto some rocks to get to the beach. And uh, because of flood runoff and maybe dallying a bit too long the tide came in and they were caught on the rocks uh still actually you know there wasn't you know there was still a lot of the tide to come in but a sneaker wave hit them while on the rocks uh pummeled my granddaughter and daughter-in-law and the dog quite hard and then dragged them out to almost open sea and uh some fishermen nearby were able to grab my granddaughter unable 
initially to grab my daughter-in-law, but the dog struggled and kept both of them from going out to sea so that someone could get to them. And uh, then they were taken to, to the hospital, bruised and cut more than just alive. They were able to go home after a period of time. Of course, aspirating salt water is never fun, so you got to go and check up on that because, yeah, pneumonia could set in. you got to be careful with salt water. Don't breathe it in. It's not good. So uh, they'll have some checkups on that, but that was harrowing. And uh, no, as many of you know, um, the trauma I'm already going under, it doesn't need to be exacerbated by this other stuff, but... Uh, I'm an old big board surfer. Never turn your back on the ocean. And, uh, yeah, give yourself plenty of time for the tide. Please. So, um, now I think I need to work on my granddaughter because she, uh, I, I just don't want her to then become afraid of the ocean necessarily. Uh, just take, take this as a learning experience, file it away and don't do that again. You know, give yourself plenty of time. And uh, that's how we become healed in the midst of tragedy, isn't it? Well, what else happened over the weekend? Well, Kirsten Nielsen did, uh, she quit. And uh, in her resignation letter, she did say that really her regret was that it's, it, she's blaming Congress and the courts for really not passing some enabling laws that Trump would like so that she could have kept her job. <sighs> well, I think she's going to land on her feet lobbying for the uh, Icebox Baby Gulag industry. And uh, so, because, you know, they're not cages. They're not dog cages. They're detention facilities. So I, I think that she'll be just fine. A lot of people are saying that, you know, she's going to be pilloried as the lady who put babies in cages. I think she's going to be lobbying and uh, for the Icebox Baby Gulag industry and maybe even have a regular appearance on Fox. I mean, she is blonde. They love that there. They really do. What's on the rest of the menu here today? At, well, that was Adam Schiff at the top. And, you know, he has no regrets calling out Trump's deeply unethical and improper conduct. God, he's so nice. He's a mobster. Probably pretty much a Russian mobster now. At least uh, he's got some, uh, uh, shall we say, deep uh, ties with the Russian mob. And he was on, uh, you know, a tear telling, uh, you know, really brown and black immigrants, brown more specifically because of the southern border, that there's no more room in the country. No more room. Turn around. And I'm thinking, well, what about those um, rich Russian anchor moms, you know, with their anchor babies? You know, they're paying big money for the condos. He doesn't mean them. There's plenty of room for them. Because when you look at all the counties that uh, Trump won in red America, pretty unpopulated. There's a lot of room to, you know, build some uh, rich Russian anchor mom and anchor baby enclaves so that they can live the life that they become accustomed to. Scary thought when you think about it, because I, <laughs> I don't know. God, It's so blatant, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, we also have a Democratic uh, primary uh, opponents uh, shaping up. It's really interesting to see how they're being shaped up by media because I have this question. When, when you're dealing with the media and you're dealing with, like, exuberance and policy and, and uh, you know, becoming president, I, I, I keep asking, really, the major media, wh wh where's the women? I mean, Kamala Harris has her plan. And Warren has her plan. And all I get to hear is like, you know, how great Buttigieg was on Face the Nation. And no one ever thinks he was. And meet the press. I don't know. Mayor Pete. I like Mayor Julian better than Mayor Pete to begin with. All right. And uh, it's not that I have anything against Mayor Pete, but um, there's quite a few constituents who say that when Mayor Pete, uh, say like, uh, made some decisions about police conduct. 
Mm-hmm. Let's just say that it wasn't as diverse as one would expect with a progressive mayor. Oh, no. So he's got that going for him. I like Mayor Julian. So I would say, you know, when they are floating this idea, how about uh, you like Mayor Pete and uh, or whoever, Beto, and, and, and then like Kamala can be vice president. I'm <laughs> thinking, no. Uh, I would, if, if I was advising Kamala or Warren or any of them, of the women, I would say offer Mayor Pete uh, a chance to run HUD. And leave it at that. Well, on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe, a West Coast cookbook and speakeasy with thousands more affected than previously reported. The Trump administration says it could take more than two years to reunite separated migrant families. They made the mess and they're going to take their time. Oh, you know, like maybe after the election, we'll fix it. Maybe. Three historically black Baptist churches have burned within 10 days in one Louisiana parish. Think about it if you start checking the other Louisiana parishes. Jeez. And Trump pretends to be a savior of the working class, but the numbers just don't add up. And they never do. I mean, let's look at his taxes. <laughs> That's why we don't get to look at him. After the break, we then move to the chef's table, where Mick Mulvaney hissed that Congress will never get Trump's tax returns. We won't. <laughs> wow. Wow, Mick. We'll see about that. And oil prices hit their highest level since November of 2018 amid OPEC's ongoing supply cuts and U.S. sanctions against Iran and Venezuela. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. flown out of the state to do another spate of taping for the TV show he's on. So we have the great honor of taking care of his uh, English bulldog, Gunner. I love Gunner. He's such a great dog. He's so friendly, and and uh, I really like him. So I'm, I'm glad that he gets to stay here while my brother is off doing his work. Hey, if you go to the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice the chat room link on the right-ish of the page monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Indeed, she does monitor it, though she has a real life. She's there, so check in. If you would then take a gander to the left edge of the page at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then notice the contribute button. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, that recurring uh, contribution will help Resistance Radio that has been on the air 24-7, 365, this powerhouse of resistance for eight years. And it's because of generosity of folks like you that have kept us going because really what uh, com what doesn't come out of our wallets comes from you because you are our biggest supporters. And thank you for that. And do help us, uh, you know, put maybe in another eight years and then another eight after that. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that rather pithily, too, I might add. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then, of course, you know I scramble to get those links on social media after that. In that little window of time, if you would like to pick up podcasts of the show, you can. But before that, if you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West. And, of course, podcasts are found on Stitcher, Spreaker, 
uh, tune in, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever fine podcasts can be found, mixed in with all the rest. Okay, this uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is Out of Think Progress by Jason Lincolns. Thousands of families separated at the U.S. southern border may have to await as long as two years to be reunited. If you're lucky, because I think when they say two years, they mean we're not doing it. I really don't think they mean that they're going to do it. Of course, the Trump administration said that in a court filing, but we already know that Trump rages when he's told he has to follow the law. Okay, and he's a real American. I don't know. Maybe real Americans don't want to follow the law. Maybe they don't. Well, a filing comes nearly four months after government inspectors released a report revealing for the first time that the Trump administration had separated thousands more children from the families than previously estimated because it's about adoptions. And I'm not kidding. Armed with that report, the ACLU successfully convinced U.S. District Judge Dana Sabra that these families should be included in a class action lawsuit the organization filed against the administration's zero tolerance policy. At the time, a lawyer for the Department of Justice warned that this would blow the case into some other galaxy of a task. Oh, how unfortunate for you. You have to reunite families that you kidnap their kids from. Well, we also know how Trump feels about judges. He wants to get rid of judges. Yeah, so much for law and order. He makes the law. You follow the orders. The ACLU said the timeline proposed by the government is unacceptable. The administration refuses to treat the family separation crisis it created with urgency, the organization wrote. We strongly oppose any plan that gives the government up to two years to find kids. The government swiftly gathered resources to tear families apart. It must do the same to fix the damage. finished moving uh, the bulk of five cubic yards of garden soil into the gardens and the raised beds that I built and uh, moved that all myself, uh, finished it off on Saturday, cleaned up the driveway and the area around the hair, pressure washed everything down yesterday. Uh, fortunately, didn't have much in the way of rain or even sprinkling on Saturday, so that uh uh, really expedited my ability to move that because heavy soil, it's wet. Ow, it's heavy. But I'll tell you, am I fatigued? I have gotten old. Oh, my God. I, I, I have to admit, I confess, I would have been able to move that pile a lot faster, I don't know, 30 years ago. And who wouldn't? Amanda Michelle Gomez of Think Progress brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Ash Mondays. Within 10 days, three historically black churches in one Louisiana parish have burned, and in this reporter's opinion, in one Louisiana parish alone. Authorities are still investigating as they've identified suspicious elements in each case. Now, now those investigators have not ruled out arson or whether the fires are connected, but given the United States' long racist history of burning black places of worship, yeah, people are understandably anxious, because I got to tell you, in this reporter's opinion, there's a lot of lone wolves out there that almost work in concert with them, with each other as a pack. They're just not with each other when they attack. They have some sort of telepathic communication. Like, I don't know, direct messaging. You can't see their lips move, but they're communicating anyway. Animals do that. 
Now, uh, it's not just in Louisiana in this one parish where historically black places of worship or gathering have burned to the ground. Museums mm -hmm, in other states. And there is an uptick of that. And it is horrendous. And there's a reason for it. And I don't care if Trump is making the stock market boom. The stock market is booming for the traders on the floor and in the boardrooms. I said trade, you know, like trade, not traitors. Though I have to admit that uh, it has been shown that the more money you make, the less real loyalty you have to a nation. Terrorizing black churches is not limited to arson. In 2015, nine black churchgoers were murdered. You know, he came in and said, uh, you're impregnating all of our white girls, so you have to die. And Dylan Roof killed them. And that was domestic terrorism. Just don't tell the administration it was. They don't believe that. Dylan Roof was white. And the proof of that is they stopped on their way to, uh, after arresting him to get a Whopper at Burger King. Now, despite the fact that homegrown terrorism is on the rise and right-wing extremist movements have been tied to the majority of the most lethal acts of terror, DHS recently disbanded a group of analysts focused on that specific issue. Makes you wonder why. I know. In America, it's not black or brown shirts. They have the history of the silver shirts. Look it up. Worker B at Alternet brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Despite his plutocratic urges and unabashed conspicuous consumption, Trump has sold himself, sometimes quite successfully, we might add, and in this reporter's opinion, as a politician who represents the working class. It's because he speaks their language, or more specifically, he speaks in an accent that they understand. Since taking office, he and his defenders have constantly boasted about the economy and have taken credit for all the job growth seen during his term, even when it, went, even when it wasn't more impressive than President Barack Obama's term in office. Or when it was because of Barack Obama and they said, hey, it happened no, during it, 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 it shot up during our time, not ever acknowledging that the policies were put in place during the Obama administration. And there's a little bit of a lag for the chip of the economy to catch up. Now, while there has been a recent surge of growth in the manufacturing sector and a surge that seems to be tapering off, we might add, wage growth for blue-collar work remains relatively unimpressive and in keeping with the past two decades. One could credibly argue that 2018 is a more important year for Trump's performance than 2017 because he has already been in office a year and his major economic policy, the GOP tax reform bill, has finally been put in place. From this perspective, Trump's record does look more positive. But Trump and his supporters rarely limit themselves to such narrow boasts, arguing falsely that Trump's election in 2016 inaugurated a grand new economic age for the country. Seagull! And as Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell's recent comments have shown, the experts expect any economic bump from the tax cuts to be transitory. The Fed has already reduced its projections for growth in the coming years. 
which has already been expected to be lower than 2018. Don't tell Trump. And the Fed has marked its growth forecast down, Paul Krugman said last month. Nobody but the Trumpies believe in the magic of their tax cut. It's possible wages will continue to rise as the labor market tightens, even if growth slows. And any reasonable observer should hope that they will, but there's little reason for celebration just yet. Except when you're trying to fix the message. And that's what they do. All right, let's get to our break. And when we come back, we are going to go through weather from around the world. I got to tell you, we've got some real weather around here. And we're going to finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, Jordan Peele, the new king of horror. Those expecting a sequel to Jordan Peele's hugely successful, darkly comic 2017 debut, Get Out, won't find it with his new one, Us. This one is darker and has fewer laughs, although the two movies do share a powerful message about the state of American society, namely the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Us tells the story of an affluent African-American family with the leads played by Winston Duke and Lapita Youngo as they vacation in Santa Cruz. The latter's character, Adelaide, is hesitant about the trip because as a young girl, she had wandered into a nearby funhouse and encountered another girl who was her mirror image. The encounter was brief but life-changing. As she tells her husband about the encounter, flashbacks show the young Adelaide diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, from which she never recovered. So when a strange family appears in the driveway of their vacation home, and whose members resemble Adelaide's family, she believes it is connected to that childhood experience. To say anything more would move us into spoiler territory. Us shows that Peel is becoming a master at combining horror, dark humor, and social commentary, and he seems to be able to attract some of the best actors working today. In particular, Youngo is amazing in her dual roles. She has an expressive face and flexible body, and watching her play both Adelaide and her scary doppelganger is a feat to appreciate. Duke is somewhat underused in the goofy, all shocks dad role, but the child actors, especially Madison Curry as the young Adelaide, are amazing. While the conclusion may be puzzling, Us is nonetheless a solid entry in the genre and then some. At the very least, you'll never view red jumpsuit the same way again. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. The hardest part of chasing monkeys through the jungle isn't the snakes. The snakes, they are not going to attack you if you don't have contact with them. It's simply keeping up with the monkeys. They are jumping from one tree to another tree, so they don't care if the landscape is difficult or if if there is a river. Jose Domingo Ordonez Gomez. He's a primatologist at the German Primate Center in Göttingen. The reason he was pursuing 35 spider monkeys through the rainforests of southern Mexico was to record their whinnies. By analyzing more than 500 calls, he found that when a monkey was separated from the group by more than 40 meters or 130 feet, it produced a lower-pitched call than when the same monkey was nearby the group. Rodonez Gomez thinks the pitch choice may be because lower-frequency calls are better suited to travel long distances through dense jungle. The findings are in the journal PLOS One. Ordonez Gomez also found that other spider monkeys responded back more quickly when they heard one of the low-pitch calls compared to a regular whinny. Perhaps, he says, because there's something about the deeper calls that really gets the attention of eavesdropping monkeys. It's a relatable feeling for any human primate who's heard a crying baby. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention.
Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser, filling in for your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. As the U.S. population ages, more people are at risk for injuries. The largest percentage of injury-related deaths among this group are caused by falls. Elizabeth Burns is with CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. She's joining us today to discuss ways to prevent injuries and deaths from falls among senior adults. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Elizabeth, what are some of the more common consequences when a senior adult falls? Well, first, it's important to note that falls are incredibly common. More than one in four older adults will fall in a given year. Common consequences include loss of independence and an increased fear of falling as older adults are afraid to do the same kinds of activities they were doing before. And this can actually lead to more falls as older adults have less strength than their lower body. Common consequences include hip fracture and traumatic brain injury. And ultimately, in 2016, almost 30,000 older adults died because of a fall. So are falls more common in men or in women? Falls are more common in women and more women go to the emergency department because of a fall, and more women die because of a fall. However, the rate of fall deaths are more common in men than women. What this means is that out of 100,000 men, more will die from a fall than out of 100,000 women. What are common causes of falls among older people? Getting on and off the toilet and getting in and out of bed are common causes of falls. Walking around the hallways at night when the lights are off is a common way people fall. There's also an increased amount of medications used in seniors, which have side effects like making them lightheaded, and that increases the risk of falls and is a common cause. With all of those factors, what are some ways our listeners can decrease their chances of falling? Older adults should talk to their health care provider or doctor about how they can decrease their chances of falling. This can be done during the annual wellness visit or during annual physicals. The doctor will recommend an exercise program that should increase strength and balance or maybe refer you to a physical therapist. Additionally, they can look through your medications and perhaps reduce your doses or suggest medications that decrease your chances of falls. Are there things we can do to modify our homes to prevent falling? Oh, absolutely. Installing grab bars on the side of the toilet, making sure that rugs are taped down or removed, making sure that there's lighting in the hallways are all really simple ways that an older adult can modify their home to prevent falls. Where can listeners go to get more information about preventing falls? Listeners can go to cdc.gov slash study, and that's spelled S-T-E-A-D-I. Thanks, Elizabeth. I've been talking today with Elizabeth Burns about ways to prevent fall-related injuries and deaths among senior adults. Improving strength and agility through regular exercise and removing potential obstacles in the home can help decrease the risk for falls. If you or a loved one is older and struggle with mobility, talk with a health care provider about ways to decrease the risks for fall-related injuries and death. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, Ask your healthcare provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1 800 CDC Info. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, 
Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. We know the answer to the first question, but the second? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And the first question is, how many state attorneys general have sued the Trump administration challenging the president's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border and his claim that he has unbridled authority to divert money from other purposes and programs appropriated by Congress in order to build his wall? The answer is 20 state attorneys general who point to Article 1 of the Constitution, which establishes the powers of Congress, which says that no money shall be spent from the federal treasury unless Congress has appropriated it. And here, Congress has specifically voted to not authorize money for the wall. But Trump says he can spend money that Congress has appropriated for some other purpose to build his wall, which raises the question before the courts and the country, Will America's system of government, built upon the premise of three co-equal branches of government, survive this attack by the executive branch against the legislative? After all, it's Congress's power of the purse that makes it co-equal. So now we know what the critically important question is. Will democracy as we know it survive? What we don't know yet is the answer. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1911. At 6.30 in the morning, an explosion shook the Banner Mine, owned by the Pratt Consolidated Coal Company. Banner was located near what would later become Birmingham, Alabama. The explosion occurred because of gases that had accumulated in the mine. The deadly gases thwarted rescue efforts. Rescue crews could hear the trapped men banging on pipes. However, they could not reach them. By the time the gases had dissipated, 128 men had died. A crowd gathered to hold a vigil at the rescue site. Yet, it was different than similar crowds at other mining disasters. Ford included few family members of the miners. That was because 125 of the deceased miners had no family nearby. They were part of the notorious Alabama convict leasing program. Starting in the 1870s, This brutal program imprisoned black men for mostly misdemeanors. The men were charged high court costs. If they could not afford to pay the cost, they were put to work doing hard labor on farms, lumber yards, railroads, and in the mines. The men had to live in deplorable housing without enough food. Some were tortured. For state prisoners, which were 90% black, the annual death rates were between 4 and 5%. For county prisoners, the death rates could be much higher. Alabama coal mining companies exploited this imprisonment and labor. They brought in convict labor to replace anyone who dared mention unionization. They paid far less for the imprisoned workers than they would have had to pay for free labor. After the Banner Mine disaster, the state passed some new mine safety regulations. But the convict lease system did not end for another 17 years. Alabama was the last state in the country to stop the convict lease program. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. In a recent two panel cartoon, a character holds a sign saying, First, they came for the reporters. In the next panel, his sign says, We don't know what happened after that. It was, of course, a retort to Donald Trump's ignorant campaign to demonize the news media as, quote, the enemy of the people. But the worst enemy of America's local and regional newspapers is not our ranting president, but a new breed of fast buck hucksters who've scooped up hundreds of America's newspapers from the bargain bins of media sell-offs. The buyers are hedge fund scavengers with nondescript names like Digital First and Gatehouse. They know nothing about journalism and care less, for they're Wall Street profiteers out to grab big bucks fast by slashing the journalistic staffs of each paper, 
voiding all employee benefits, shriveling the paper's size and news content, selling the presses and other assets, tripling the price of their inferior product, then declaring bankruptcy, shutting down the paper and auctioning off the bones before moving on to plunder another town's paper. America's two largest newspaper chains today are not venerable publishers with a basic commitment to civic responsibility, but Gatehouse and Digital First, whose managers believe that good journalism is measured by the personal profits they can squeeze from it. As revealed last year in an American Prospect article, Gatehouse executives had demanded that his papers cut $27 million from their operating expenses, eliminating jobs and slashing paychecks. Meanwhile, one employee... The hedge fund CEO extracted $54 million in personal pay from the conglomerate, including an $11 million bonus. This is Jim Hightower saying, To these absentee Wall Street owners, newspapers are no more than big pipelines, a means of hauling enormous financial wealth and social well-being out of our communities. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. Where it is currently 57 degrees, we are looking at a high of possibly 63, 64. We do at the moment have pounding rain and will have showers all the rest of the day. We are also under an active flood watch. Reservoirs uh, just in elevations above us are brimming to uh, the brim. (laughs) They're full. All the way to the brim. And uh, they have to release quite a bit of water. And the Rogue River currently is raging at a level that we haven't seen in quite some time. I would say it's at... It's historic level because it's right where the boat ramps are, just at the bottom of the boat ramps. So they went even higher up the boat ramps. But you know how human nature is. Oh, we have a drought. Well, look at all that land along the river. We'll we'll build RV parks there. And they did. And uh, all those RV parks have to move their, uh, their RVs out of there because it's in the water and it's moving. And it can pick up an RV and move it down river. So uh, a lot of people are pissed off about that. No. Well, <laughs> you know, there's a difference between weather and there's a difference between climate. And you know what happens when you get hit by both? Yeah, it's a perfect storm. Enough of that. It looks like uh, we're going to get about uh, an inch of rain today. Another quarter inch tonight. And about a tenth of an inch tomorrow. Winds currently are out of the northeast. uh, Negligible one to two miles per hour will pick up and move out of the southwest in a couple of hours at five to ten miles per hour and remain at that clip. Though moving due west, out of due west. Is that possible? If you're going due west, that means you're going to the west. But it's coming out of west proper and (laughs) continuing at a five to ten mile per hour clip. And tomorrow, uh, west-northwest uh, at 5 to 10 miles per hour when we get even more, well, not as much rain, though tomorrow night it is expected to pick up. And we actually have quite a bit of rain in the foreseeable future. Pollen is rated at none, probably because it's been washed from the sky. Air quality is good at 8 
and uh, eight parts per million. And the daytime UV index is in the moderate range, but down to three. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.81 inches. Visibility is down to two miles and relative humidity is at 97% because it's wet out there. Really wet. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 54 and cloudy. Paris is 63 and partly cloudy. Rome is 62 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 70 degrees and fair. Kiev. Well, okay, I guess it's time. Kabul is 63 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 75 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 44 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 71 and clear. San Francisco, California is 54 degrees and mostly cloudy with a weather advisory. A small craft advisory for small craft on uh, the bay and, uh, and of course, offshore. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Joyna Shaku of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Trump's tax returns will never be handed over to Democratic lawmakers. White House Chief of Staff Mick the Prick Mulvaney said on Sunday, oh, Mick the Prick is uh, an appellation that has been, uh, well, uh, put on by me. So don't, 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 don't blame Joyna. Okay. And as he's also defying an effort in Congress to learn more about the real estate mogul's financial, personal finances, and all of his financials, too, I might add. Asked on Fox News Sunday if congressional Democrats will succeed in obtaining the Republican president's tax returns, Mulvaney said no, never, nor should they. Now, excuse me, Doina, let me uh, interject just a tad here. It's Congress that wants his tax returns. Congress. We can make it bipartisan, but we're talking about Congress and the White House, a separation of powers. It's not Democratic lawmakers. It's Congress. Mulvaney said Democrats are demanding that the IRS turn over the documents. That is not going to happen, and they know it. This is a political stunt. Excuse me. It's the law. Democrats countered that Neal's request to the Treasury Department for Trump's returns is grounded in law and a needed inquiry, given Trump's refusal to disclose his tax records and to divest himself of his business interests. Of course, uh, Richard Neal is uh, on the House Tax Committee. So let's remember that. The chair. And by law, IRS shall... Turn over the returns and the records, not might, but shall. And, uh, you know, of course, you're going to have Mick the prick say otherwise. Democratic Representative Ben Ray Lujan noted that presidents for decades have voluntarily released their income tax returns. This is not political, as our Republican colleagues are making it out to be, he told Fox News Sunday. Why was he on Fox? An attorney for Trump on Friday blasted House Democrats' request for six years of Trump's personal and business returns as a misguided attempt to politicize the tax laws, accusing lawmakers of harassment and interference in IRS audits. No, you turn over your tax records because you're a mobster. And we're following the rubles, buddy, wherever they might be. One of the many investigations targeting Trump on Capitol Hill and in the U.S. court system, 
The U.S. Democrats' probe into Trump's tax returns could pull back the curtain on his business empire and his reputation as a deal maker. Well, we already know about that. He goes bankrupt a lot. As a presidential candidate in 2016, Trump broke with the decades-old practice of making his tax returns public and continues to refuse to release them as president while retaining ownership in many enterprises ranging from golf courses and hotels and other properties that he can be compromised over and already is in this reporter's opinion. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers our final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays is by Henning Gloystein and Dmitry Zandekoff out of Reuters. Oil prices rose to their highest since November on Monday, driven by OPEC supply cuts, U.S. sanctions against Iran and Venezuela, and fighting in Libya, as well as a strong U.S. jobs data. You got a better job? You got to pay more for your gas. International benchmark Brent futures were at $70.70 per barrel, up 30 cent, 36 cents or a half percent from their last close. To prop up prices, the Organization of Petroleum Export Countries, affectionately known as OPEC, and allies such as Russia, pledged to withhold about 1.2 million barrels per day, of supply from the start of this year. That's right. Cut back in supply, demand goes up, and so do prices. OPEC's ongoing supply cuts and U.S. sanctions on Iran and Venezuela have been major drivers of prices throughout this year. But you know, wind gives you cancer, and oil doesn't. Remember that, okay? Russia is a reluctant participant in its agreement with OPEC and may increase production if the deal is not extended before it expires on July 1st. Another key architect of the OPEC-Russia deal, Kirill Dmitriev, the head of Russia's direct investment fund, said uh, today that OPEC and its allies should raise output from June. Dmitry, Dmitriev previously said it was too early to pull back from cuts. Russian oil output reached a national record high of 11.16 million barrels last year in the U.S. Crude production reached a global record of 12.2 million barrels. U.S. crude exports have also risen, breaking through the 3 million barrels for the first time earlier this year, but there also remain concerns about the global economy, especially should China and the United States fail to resolve their trade disputes soon. And that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. And you know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on. Hey, let's meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Sous 
Dans mon jardin d'hiver, dans mon jardin d'hiver. 